All right. So today's topic is brand measurement on a shoestring. I'll go through sort of my personal journey of how I came to appreciate it. It involved a lot of uh, some poor career decisions. Eventually, I made my way to Ohio State. I'm not going to provide a lot of answers today, unfortunately, because we haven't figured out everything we're doing in terms of brand measurement. But there's three things I'll promise today. So one is I'll make a couple of temp attempts at humor. And first off is that little asterisk down in the bottom right-hand corner, so I can check the box on that. Second, I'm going to make it really personal. Like, there might be some things I tell you today that you will never unforget. And then the last thing is hopefully I'll just share our latest thinking, and then hopefully we can make something of a conversation about how you might be able to apply it in some different situations where you might be. Fair enough? All right. So let me start off by talking about who am I, so I promised I would do an introduction. Um, I'll tell you who I, am, who I am, and I'll give you four free life lessons. So this is sort of in, in addition to all these great brand measurement lessons you're going to get, you get free life, life guidance. So on the far right, that's me. I really did have hair at one point. Um, the first life lessons I, I have, though, to offer is that if you have the upper body strength of a cyclist, don't play contact sports, because you get run over a lot. The second photo, that is Brian O'Bear of Silver Sun Pickups. It is not me, just for clarification. So if you do Google me and you see sort of a handsome man with some crazy hair and a beard, that is not me. Um, but the second life lesson to get out of this is that there's always somebody cooler than you, and you can't do anything about it on Google search results. Third, I like cycling. I'm a big fan of Strengths Finder. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Um, the life lesson I would say is gravitate towards your strengths. And like I mentioned, you know, if you're built with the upper body strength of a cyclist, you should probably go into cycling. And then finally, I'm a Hufflepuff. So I'm going to admit that right now. I thought I would be Ravenclaw or Gryffindor, but this is kind of what the sorting hat threw at me. I'm not really happy about it. Um, but the fourth life, life lesson I can share with you is that you're not always in control of what happens, but things tend to work out. So it turns out my wife is also a Hufflepuff. There are people here tonight who recognize that I'm wearing a Hufflepuff lapel pin, and they said they're a Hufflepuff too. So things kind of work out for the better. And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about is in career-wise, things have worked out even though I didn't necessarily have control of what was going on. So all right, let's start talking about brand health. So why does brand health or brand equity even matter? Like why should you care if you're in the digital analytics space or the web analytics space? I think the main reason is because it, it, it's worth billions and billions of dollars. Um, accountants at major corporations listed on the books under goodwill. Look how happy it makes this accountant to calculate brand valuation. Um, I can just picture her trying to calculate. Maybe she calculated the value of Apple. So Interbrand is a brand age, uh, consultant. They rank the brands. I'm going to read this. So they rank brands based on three criteria, which is the financial performance of a company's branded products, the role the brand plays in convincing customers to choose the company, and three, whether the brand allows the company to charge a premium for its products. See, these are like really big numbers, like big numbers that people should care about. And one thing as I was starting to research about brand valuation, what I found interesting is that even in sort of the startup community or in smaller companies, brand valuation becomes really important because it can be baked into sale prices, right? So it's, you're not just buying the company, you're buying this additional asset. So it matters, right? So this is not me. This is not my dad. This is actually Michael Kahn. He was the global CEO of Performix. I think he just got promoted. Now he heads up um, Digitas globally. He does inspire my haircut. Um, but why am I talking about him is that I found myself in Chicago. This guy hired me. I got into a digital marketing with a company called DoubleClick Performix. You may have heard of one half of that company. Google eventually bought DoubleClick. Um, but when I was in Chicago, I really found sort of nirvana, direct response nirvana, and that was paid search, right? It's the bottom of the funnel. You're just raking in clicks and revenue, and it's not, you don't have to push. You don't have to go ask anybody. Like, they're coming to you. This is like the greatest thing ever to get in, right? Google's taking off. It's getting huge. Um, and so I like jumped on the Google wave, and I wrote it through Performix. 
uh, carried me over to Bath and Body Works. That's how I ended up in Columbus. And then I eventually followed former, what do you call it, Columbus Web Analytics Wednesday or -er Andy Kenimer. Some of you guys know him. He was at Victoria's Secret. He's now at Abercrombie. Well, I actually followed him to Chase. And I thought, oh man, I'm going to go to Chase. We're building up a digital marketing team. And I'm just going to ride this Google wave. Like, this is so easy. The model is there. And then I got there, and pretty much all of the bottom of the funnel channels had been maxed out. Right? And I was like, oh crap. Like, what am I going to do now? I, had this, I thought I had this like three year playbook coming in here, and somebody's already done it. So I kind of looked around, right? You got to figure out what's next. Kind of looked around, what's the next wave? All right, Facebook, right? Like, that's huge, and that's taking off. And man, we turned that thing into an acquisition machine, right? We started pouring millions of dollars into Facebook advertising. Direct response, we were driving checking accounts. Um, and a lot of that, it wasn't last click attribution, but we figured out some really interesting ways to set up tests to measure the ROI on it. And again, it was just a machine that we turned on and we're just dumping money into it. And once a quarter at Chase, everybody would gather in a big conference room and you'd have the marketing research team come in, and everybody would look at the brand tracker. So it was like this sort of holy unveiling of the brand tracker report. And you'd look at awareness and consideration and spider charts and customer quotes and verbatims, and it was amazing. You could see how Chase was doing it against Bank of America and Wells Fargo. It was, it was amazing, right? And then everybody would leave the conference room and go back to cubicles and start thinking about acquisition and revenue and new customers and ROI. And nobody ever talked about brand, right? Once a quarter you talked about it and then you went back and did your day job because you gotta make money, right? You have big budgets, you're driving huge amounts of sales. Okay, brand's like a nice to know about. And maybe somebody in New York was kind of worrying about it. There's a lot of marketing folks in New York. So things are going great at Chase. We're crushing it in direct response. We had Google going, we had Facebook, we have huge budgets, right? So I thought, why don't I move to Ohio State? That just seems like it makes perfect sense, right? And not just move to Ohio State, but they're gonna build a new branding marketing organization. I mean, this just seems like, it just makes all the sense in the world to give up, sort of everything that's going great, move to Chase. So I do it, right? My wife works at a nonprofit, it felt good, right, to go from a, Horrible Wall Street bank, move over to a nice nonprofit, feels good. But now I'm the guy that has to care about the brand and figure out like how do we measure this and what is it worth? Um, so let me tell you a little bit about our group at, at Ohio State. So there's a group called University Marketing, we're sort of a central um, center of excellence. Our mission really is to bring modern, sophisticated marketing to bear in order to enhance reputation and drive choice, right? So we wanna look throughout the funnel for different audiences. Um, we're not necessarily running a lot of the direct response efforts at, at, the, at the university, um, but we do a ton, just a ton, content marketing, email, social, all kinds of websites. I mean, we just do so much marketing activity. Um, but we better really figure out how do we measure the value of the brand, right? Because at some point, we're going to have to justify all this investment in our organization, investment in all this marketing activity. So, yeah, we need to prove value to the university, but I think in a, you know, at the end of the day, we also need to sort of justify why we're doing all this stuff and maybe hopefully we can keep our jobs for a little longer. Whoops. So we started the journey, figure out, okay, how are we gonna measure all this stuff? And really what we did is we looked around and we said, man, we have a lot of stuff that we can, we have a lot of stuff on hand that we can measure. Um, we have a ton of digital metrics like brand search volume and social audience sizes and email deliverability and conversion rates for online giving. We have all this stuff. And we're like, okay, let's try to piece these things together and figure out well, this, this could be brand health, right, if we do all this. But what ended up happening is this was very practitioner focused. This is the stuff that people pull levers on, right, to optimize programs that are in market. And we sort of took a step back and we said, okay, let's, is this stuff actionable? And then could our marketing activity move the needle on these types of things? And I think the answer is, is yes, but it doesn't really help us understand how audiences perceive our brand. It doesn't really help us understand motivations for doing these transactions or doing these actions. Um, but we started to learn, right? And this stuff, this work isn't wasted, right? Because it was good learning. And what it helped us do in the organization is think about uh, diagnostics. 
Um, so the ability to reach our audiences is still really crucial to being effective. And so we didn't figure out the brand health holy grail, but we did introduce the organization of, hey, you better start looking at page load time, right? Like, are you lowering the barriers for people to interact with us? Email deliver deliverability, right? Are you getting in the inbox or are you getting blocked by um, ISPs? Are you getting blocked or uh, dropped in the spam folder? Brand search volume, right? Are people still looking for you? Are you still in the consideration set? Um, social audience sizes, are we still seeing sort of net gain in audience sizes? Are people abandoning us? And then just general social activity, right? Are we keeping up the same level of publishing um, are we receiving industry levels of engagement, right? So there's some value in it. And as we're starting to look through these diagnostics, we also started to think about, well, how do we assess if this stuff is good or bad? So one of the things is I talked about university marketing. Well, our organization isn't even two years old at this point. So we don't have a lot of historical data. We don't have a lot of year over year understanding of seasonality. So we had to sort of think about what's the best way to assess good or bad. So obviously we're gonna look at ourselves, right? We can look at month over month movement, we can look at year over year performance, but then we start really started to think about how do we find some external validation of what we're doing? And that's when we get into this competitive benchmarking. So on one hand, we started to look pretty broad and started to identify who are some competitors or institutions that look like us. I mean, that's pretty simple. So we started looking at who's really big, who does research, um, who's a land grant, who's a state flagship school, right? So we created this um, sort of group, and it tended to be kind of a lengthy list of who we might want to benchmark against. But what we found is when you try to apply that, those benchmarks to what you're doing in social or what we're doing in email, it, was like, it, it, it just was sort of untenable, right? Because everybody has different strategies, everybody has different uh, areas of investment. And so then we took it a little deeper, and we went channel by channel and created a list of, okay, who looks like us? Who should we be um, kind of competing with? But at the same time, who, is, who has what seem to be similar strategies to us? So a good example is in email, right? So we look at, yeah, we're gonna look at Michigan and we're gonna look at Penn State, but we're also gonna look at Virginia because we wanna look at something that might be a little more aspirational for us, right? Virginia, they've invested in a huge marketing organization and they have a fantastic daily email that goes out. In social, right, yeah, we're gonna go look at um, Michigan and Penn State and Michigan State, and they're sort of similar in size, but we're gonna look at some aspirational groups too. Now, one of the lessons from looking at these aspirational schools is we started to look at Harvard, right? And we have some competitive intelligence tools that'll tell us volume of posting and engagement value. Problem is, Harvard maybe, maybe is a little too aspirational for us. So their like, Facebook channel has something like six million followers. Like, we, we don't have that. So anytime they do one post, right, they're gonna be like 10 times the volume. And when you average it in with some of these other schools, it was throwing off our averages. So really what we ended up getting out of this was just through learning, trial and error, we were able to narrow into what really makes sense for us in terms of being our benchmarks. All right, so then we took a step back we're doing some good work, we're learning, um, but we went back to sort of our mission as an organization and thinking about enhancing reputation, driving choice. Okay, we really need to get a clear definition of, of what are we talking about when we talk about brand health or brand equity. And if you guys go and just do Google searches, like I'm not an expert in brand. I literally was Googling like, how do I calculate brand value? How do I calculate brand equity? And you find like some crazy crackpot stuff out there. Like everybody and their brother has a definition, everybody who's a consultant is setting up a blog about it. Um, so we had to take a step back, and I say we, right? This was a couple of people, a team working on this, and we just needed to come up with a definition that made sense for our organization. Um, so we went through a couple different iterations, but we finally landed on this sort of dual nature. So what we're thinking about with brand health is, is really what's, what's happening in the short term. When we're doing lots of marketing activity can we see that the needle is moving a little bit? And then in sort of the long term, we're thinking about this brand equity, which is, hey, it's not gonna move day to day, it's not gonna move quarter to quarter, but is it the accumulated value of all the things that we've been doing over the course of years? Uh, and sort of the metaphor I like to use to describe it is, if you like follow the stock market, your brand health might be more like your stock price, right? That thing's gonna go up and down, up and down, up and down. 
brand equity might be more of the long-term value of the company, right? The net present value of all the stuff that's going on. I know if we have some finance majors in here, you might quibble over the calculations, but just go with me, right? Short-term, long-term. And then we started to overlay some of the brand work that's going on at Ohio State. Um, we're thinking about this framework of four R's, which is recognition, relevance, resonance, and reputation. And so once we started to put this on paper and merge it all together, it's just sort of felt like we're on the right track. All right, so now we're gonna get into some of the weeds of where we're going. So we have this model now. We think this is going to represent brand health, but let's get a little more specific and start asking the questions of what does it actually mean when we talk about recognition? Or what does it, talk, what does it mean when we talk about relevance? So again, sort of weeks and weeks of working through what are the right questions to ask, and then what are the right metrics that are gonna answer those questions? So let's, let's sort of talk about recognition, right? People need to know who we are. You need that base level of awareness or they're not gonna sort of enter the funnel. They're not gonna interact with us. But Ohio State doesn't really have an awareness problem necessarily. You pretty much can go anywhere in the US and you can even kind of go abroad. And if you say Ohio State, I think people, they'll recognize it. So awareness isn't necessarily the problem. So we drilled down a little deeper into recognition and thought, you know what, people don't, they know Ohio State, but they typically know us for being really big or for football. We, want, we need them to know about sort of the lines of business that we're in or the industries that we participate in. So we came up with this idea about thinking about marketing categories, right? Do people associate Ohio State with athletics, with research, with academics, with patient care, right? We have a huge um, medical center. So we're trying to think of what are these different categories that we want, we, we do these things, and do people know that we do these things? Um, and then when you start to think about, well, how, how the heck do you measure that, right? Um, so some of the things, that, some of the metrics that we're playing around with are simple mentions, right? So doing some social listening, count how many times you're, you're picking up Ohio State plus a certain mat, uh, marketing category. But then that'll give you some general perception of what's out there, but it doesn't really help us understand the different audiences that we serve. So one of the things that's really complicated at working at a university is that we have these really distinct audiences. And this is something I didn't experience when selling lotion at Bath and Body Works or checking accounts at Chase. Prospective students are really different than current students, are really different than alumni, are really different than corporate donors, are really different than prospective faculty that we want to recruit, right? You have all these very distinct audiences. I mean, very different than patients. So at some point, we're gonna to have to understand what are these brand perceptions by audience. And that, I think, is where we're headed is to measure that, I think we need to get into more of survey research. So do we get into sort of unaided awareness, right? When you think, uh, when you think of Ohio State, what are some of the things that you associate with the university? So getting into letting people tell us what they associated with um, can help us set a benchmark under recognition. So then if you go down to, to relevance, this is where we wanna get into do people know us for certain things? So it's great if you know that we're, that we're in patient care or in research, but as we develop a brand, at some point we're gonna be, wanna be known for that sort of distinctive, authentic thing, right, that separates us from other universities. And now I can't, we're in sort of that work right now, so we haven't drilled down to say, hey, we wanna be known for innovation or we wanna be known for um, inclusion. We're still working through some of that, those things, but once we get to sort of nailing what the brand is, the measurement of that starts to become, hey, are we being associated with the, these relevant topics? So one, again, you can start to do social listening, counting mentions of is Ohio State associated with certain topics, but again, then getting back into some survey research so you can drill in to understand how different audiences are perceiving us. Things change up a little bit when you go into resonance. So when we talk about resonance, we're talking about is there an affinity for or a preference for Ohio State. So this is going beyond like, hey, great, I know Ohio State for this thing. It's getting into, hey, I know Ohio State does this thing and I prefer to go to them because they offer it or because it's Ohio State. So this is where you're start, we, we wanna start getting into um, understanding satisfaction and get, understanding sentiment about Ohio State. So some of the metrics that we're exploring right now are looking at shifts in volume of sentiment or shifts, shifts in volume of Ohio State being associated with different market categories or with different topics. Um, and then you start to get into some reputational things, right? 
um, asking people would they willingly advocate on her behalf. So one of the challenges we came up with or that we encountered in this process is there's so much data right now about social sharing, right? We can go on Facebook and we know the volume, the type. We can go on Twitter, we know all the activity that's happening, but what we don't know is necessarily is who's doing that activity. And I, I, I think my perception going to this, man, social listening, we're gonna solve all these problems. But what we ended up finding is that we just don't have the tools right now to get to an audience understanding of perception of our brand or of sentiment. And I think that's where it's gonna get into more of the survey research where we're gonna have to pull out those kind of metrics. And then finally, when you get to reputation, reputation is closely aligned, I think, with where we're going in terms of being that measure of brand health, right? This is where you're really finally understanding how people manifest what they believe about Ohio State, what they're saying about us. And to me, this is probably the, the place where it's the most trustworthy measurement, right? This is unsolicited, unsolicited expression of passion for Ohio State, preference for Ohio State. So we're thinking about things like, um, what, are there certain thought leaders talking about us in the space? Um, are people talking about Ohio State on ratings and reviews? We're trying to accumulate that data that's, I guess, really authentic expression of a brand preference. So we had that nice model, and where we ended up going was we really drilled into the weeds. And this is just an example of trying to go from this idea of, hey, we're asking a question to, well, how do you answer that question or what metric might represent an answer? To, okay, so how the heck do you measure that thing? Because it's, you know, we don't necessarily have the right tools in place. And then it's trying to assess, okay, once you measure it, how do you know if it's good or bad? And I, it, whether it was from tools that we can measure now or getting into some of the survey research that we, we need to develop, um, it was a pretty time intensive task to get to this. But for every question that we've developed, we've gone through and done this exercise to really understand what we need. And this is kind of where we are right now. So we're, the future state is we know we need to get more sophisticated in our survey research. We know we need to go back and reassess our social intelligence and our social, social listening. Because right now we're doing very high level, hey, Ohio State plus football. Ohio State plus uh, crisis, right? We're doing this very high level stuff. Um, but we really haven't thought through how to slice and dice our social listening to understand and inform our audience insights. Um, but I think we're moving in the right direction. We're gonna get there to where we're thinking about brand health and reputation. But then what's really looming on the horizon is it's great once you can get to a brand health measurement. But then when you think about our mission, which is enhance the reputation and drive choice, it's trying to figure out, hey, it's great to have this brand health. Hey, maybe we'll look at it in a big conference room once a quarter. But what does that mean then for giving and for inquiring and applying to the school and volunteering? Um, I think that's, that's a big thing, Chase. At Chase, we hadn't figured it out. At Ohio State, we haven't figured it out. But it makes sense for us to do it, right? Because it fulfills our mission as an organization. And then it makes sense because at some point, right, intuitively, brand is really important. Because if you have a good brand, it makes your direct mail pieces more effective, right? Because people instantly recognize it. It makes it easier for a recruiter to go into a high school and talk to somebody. Because they don't have to do that first step of, hey, we're this college, come talk to us, right? You, they're already arrived. It's easier for corporate donor and corporate relations people to go into Honda and talk about corporate partnerships, right? Because they don't have to introduce themselves. But they already have that foot in the door of recognition and understanding of what we have to offer. So we're not there. I was really hoping that today people would sort of pepper with questions and start to peel back what we're doing here. Because I don't know if we're thinking about it the right way, to be honest. Like that really is me half the time when I'm at work. So what I would love to kind of hear from you guys is like, different brands, different businesses. How do you guys think about brand health? How are you translating your digital analytics? How are you translating your sales and revenue generation and trying to tie it back to brand health and decision making and audience insights? Because ultimately that's what I think we're trying to get to and we just haven't gotten there. So I'm gonna leave the questions with you guys.
That's all I have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, is that all part of a brand or is that its own thing? Because it seems like a great many of the people who go there are going there because they have an illness. They're not going to Ohio State necessarily. They're going to the great medical facility. You know, and you could probably split out a lot of the things that have Ohio State slap on them but really are getting customers, so to speak, through entirely different paths. So is it really one brand? So I, the vision is that it should be one brand. And think of, the, so the, the example our chief marketing officer uses is take the College of Nursing at Ohio State. If you plop that school and put it at Otterbein, is the messaging at the College of Nursing the same or does it change because they don't have Ohio State associated with it? So a lot of what we're thinking about is you have this overarching brand at the top and there should be, hey, we're helping support the different lines, I always say lines of business, but the different units. But at the same time, the work they're doing needs to reinforce the overarching brand. And you're right, we're not there at all. And you, you see that a lot in terms of misuse of logos, um, inconsistent look and feel. I mean, it, it, off the record, right, if you go look at our website, you might wonder if that's all one brand or one, one institution. The, the we're live streaming, so your your ability to be off the record. Yeah, no, I know. We have no. I mean, hey, the nice thing is we're a public institution, so it's not like I can go hide our website or. Uh... <laughs> but it, yeah, it's 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 sort of a known issue, but it, there's strength in both because you do really have these strong, there's strong affinity for the for these different units, right? People love uh, the James, right? People love our athletics program. How do you start connecting these things and creating more of a consistent? look and feel and understanding of what we offer. Here, hold on, I'm gonna, yeah. okay. since we are live You are doing it, you're like the Donahue of the. <laughs> really? That was Brian, Hu that was Brian Huber That's... said that. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Uh, my name's Shannon, full disclosure, I'm an uh, Ohio State alum. So uh, I would say that maybe I have a bit of an investment in what you're thinking about or at least I did when I was attending. So I like what you're thinking about here. I like how you've laid out how you have uh, operationalized the construct, so to speak, and then how you plan to measure it. And you're right, what you're talking about is something that is sticky, uh, it, or more squishy, let's call it squishy. Yeah. Uh, it's something you can't touch or see, and I totally agree with the approach that you kind of have to measure around the edges, right? Um, a couple thoughts. One would be uh, whether or not brand in all situations is something that will drive changes in brand. Will that indeed drive uh, changes in consideration set, changes in uh, uh, all these metrics that you're hoping to drive? And in some instances, that that may be doable. In others, it might not be one. You know, uh, if students can't afford to come here, it doesn't really matter if they think it's the best place or not. Uh, <laughs> there's other factors. Uh, and then two, brand may be conflated as well in this place with um, brand health. Uh, what, you know, the cart and the horse here. Does brand health drive how much people recognize the, say, direct marketing? Or does the amount of direct marketing uh, help to drive that brand health? Um, I, and, and, and finally, I'd say, if you're working on survey stuff, I do know that Ohio State has some exceptional researchers that are focused on surveys, uh, psychometrics, all of these factors, and that uh, if you haven't reached out to them, they may be really <laughs> interested in uh, collaborating. Um, so good luck. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, so a couple, an interesting point you're talking about, do you sort of direct response efforts drive, can they drive brand as well as can brand also drive some direct response? And some of you folks will know Manish Dada, right? So he used to come to a lot of these things. He worked at Victoria's Secret. I'm doing a lot of name dropping today. Um, I remember him talking about that too. Is like, it, it really is a two way street that both are gonna play into one another. I think we wanna get to that point where they're working together and not sort of in opposed, you know, they're not opposed to one another. So like the classic, 
new CMO comes in, what's the classic move? I want to see all the brochures for student recruitment, put them on one conference table, right? And then you take a look at it and you're like, okay, they don't look the same. Somebody's got a purple brochure. Maybe we shouldn't have purple brochures at Ohio State. Um, right, there's real opportunity that they should be able to play off one another. That was, an, uh, that was a, a key learning at Chase as well, that we, Chase had a direct mail program that was a machine, right? Um, you know, they had 20 years of data, um, PhDs working on modeling. I mean, this thing, it was amazing. Like, it, it truly is amazing. But when a new C CMO came in and said, hey, you really need to elevate this brand, people were really scared, right? Because you can't just go and like, change variables in your direct mail pieces, you gotta test into it. But what we end up finding is by elevating the brand work, the look and the feel, and incorporating it more with other efforts, we did see conversion rates go up and we did see profitability go up. Or at least in some cases, you didn't see any declines in revenue, right? <laughs> it, it was a tie and that was good enough. So yeah, I think there's opportunity in both. And you're right, the research, it's crazy. The, the, the talent at Ohio State, that we can tap into. Um, yeah, I talked about like PhDs at Chase. Obviously, Ohio State is just loaded with them. So I've had, I've had the pleasure of working with um, a professor in the uh, communications department, a professor in the marketing department, and people are really generous with their time. There also are just tons of professionals who are focused on research. Center for Student Study of Student Life. We have marketing researchers on staff. Yeah, it's a pretty, pretty amazing place. Brian, are, are you going to be putting on a show for us later? Just kidding. I've been dying <laughs> to get that joke in, Silver Sun pickups. Um, you, you talked a lot about uh, categories there, like how do you, how do you um, re relate the brand to brand to categories. One word I don't think I didn't see up there was external events, or perhaps not necessarily external, but, you know, it's not a great example, but there's probably a ton of searches going on for the Weinstein movie company now, right? I and told those, my wife that would not come up in this presentation. Yes, she thought that would be did, a bad but, topic. But but you know, it's like um, the local the, the local media has been covering a lot about this uh, alt right group that wants to sue um, Ohio State. So, how do you measure or stay? aware of external e events that might, that might be suddenly spiking people searching for, for, for you know, um, the brand? Yeah, so we do, we do sort of always on social listening. And we've created, I, would, I, I think, are pretty robust um, measurements when it comes to sort of crisis communications. I mean, you can think of all the horrible keywords that we want to search for that are associated with Ohio State. So we do have monitoring in place and we have alerts that'll pop up when we see certain trending topics hit Ohio State. Um, so you're on a shoestring, what, what are you doing? What are the tools that you're using for the monitoring? Yeah, so we use Brandwatch for our social listening right now. Um, but the other, I would say the other piece is that when we look at the end of the month, right, when we pull reporting and we look at what happened, we're trying to understand what is sort of baseline activity versus what are some of these spikes or something that goes viral. Like we're coming up in November, right? If you remember last year, there was an attack on campus um, in November. And when you look at our year over year marketing metrics, you see this crazy big spike. And we know exactly what, ha we know it's, 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 it's affiliated with that attack on campus. So we've tried to do some work to go back and try to smooth out or take out the outliers to understand what truly is more of the baseline activity and then what might be some of the outliers or things that we can't replicate. And some of that goes back to we don't, we don't want to take credit for those external events, you know what I mean? We don't want to, that's not part of our marketing activity. Um, so we really do try our best to separate what we control and, and what might be an external. Um, that, that kills you for a year because it blows you, because now your compares are screwed up. Yeah. Until a year later. Well, yeah, and, and so you guys know it. So in November, we had a crazy spike last year because of the attack on campus. Then John Glenn passed away, right? There's a college at Ohio State, the John Glenn College of Public Affairs. Um, and so you saw another spike in December. So we just got to the point where we have year-over-year -year data. So we really are hustling to try to smooth out what happened last year so we can try to have a better understanding of what to expect as we go into November and December of this year. So, so one of the questions, my name's Matt Schonkweiler. Um, 
and one of the questions that is kind of going through my head is, how, at what point should you uh, have one central brand that people recognize Ohio State for the hospital and the this and the that and, and all the lots and lots of things going on for, for that particular brand versus when should you diversify? Like if you were an investment, an investor, you would say, well, diversify, don't have all your eggs in one basket. And at what, brand does, at what point does your brand become a liability? Uh, and essentially having, not, not that yours is, <laughs> Ohio Ohio State. State. I love Ohio State. So <laughs> I'm a huge fan of Ohio State. So the, but what point does it become like, okay, well, this, this one wing of the business isn't doing very well and then causes a stain across the whole organization because of the one central brand being the encompassing it all. See, I would, I would turn that around and say by having a really powerful central brand, you can weather these events that happen in, say, a, a certain line of business or in one unit or another. Um, yeah, it's, it's almost protection, right? Or insurance against those small outliers that might happen. Um, Again, do, I, do you guys monitor stuff like the James or like, I mean, you've got OSU, but some of those other brands, do you, does that fall under brand marketing or no? Yes, yeah, so we actually have a pretty distributed organization. So where we have a central group in university marketing that's focused on marketing and uh, marketing communications, every unit around campus, they'll have marketers and communicators as well. Um, but like the Wexner Medical Center, they have a team, and they're I know they're using Brand Watch, and they're listening for all sorts of things as well. So you see different levels of sophistication across in different groups around campus. Does Oklahoma State have a special place in hell for you, just from a keyword tracking? I can't comment on that. Huh? <laughs> uh, your name makes you sound very smart, by the way. Just thought you should. <laughs> Um, so I just want to say thanks for like the last slide there, basically admitting that this is always a work in progress and we don't fully always know how to measure something um, and that it can change over time. So I think something for all the younger people to understand too is um, just because it's being done a certain way doesn't mean that it's the best way or that it's fully, you know, concrete. So. Um, the data changes, the what you collect changes, and you know how good you think it is, that can change over time as well. So uh, thanks for, no, I thanks for highlighting yeah. that. <laughs> no, and I think that's a really important point too, because you, it's interesting to see how important creativity is in analytics. Like you really do have to understand what the problem is that you're trying to solve, that it just can't be a single report that'll give you all the answers. It to me, I think the, the really successful analysts I've seen in my career have been the ones who can help create the frameworks and help create the questions that should be answered and then go and sort of figure out how to answer it. Um, they aren't the ones that are just saying, that can do, go execute on somebody else's work. Hi, my name is Jennifer. And you made mention kind of talking about the brands within the brands, right? Um, do you, would you find value in kind of having those marketers in each brand come back and like actually align on your metrics for measuring brand health and brand equity and you know align on the different types of creative you use like kind of having a center of excellence so to speak for your individual brands underneath your umbrella no you br you bring up a good point it's it one way we're trying to bring more alignment across campus is trying to um, get people onto the same reporting platforms. So one of the, just in the past year, getting everybody on Google Analytics and starting to report on things in a similar fashion, I mean, that's been a year-long process, right, to get there. Um, and then it's a similar effort with some of the other tools we'll use for, say, social listening or, right, trying to get people onto similar platforms so that you can share expertise, right, that you um, are defining metrics in the same way. That's, that's an ongoing uh, <laughs> effort at, at Ohio State.
Thank you. <laughs> this may be a pedestrian question, but is there one key metric or one piece of data that you wish you had that you would have paid attention to? Could you have done so? Basically, what would be the fair warning to all of us? Oh. I mean, if I had my druthers, I'd pay a quarter million dollars and have Millward Brown just do a brand tracker for us. But that's, I, I think the struggle is we haven't been able to get down to sort of a metric. I mean, ideally, I would love to be able to take this brand health and figure out how all those pieces add together and come up with like a brand health index. And every quarter, you only have to look at one number. Is it up or down? And you can explain what it is. So if you have thoughts on how you can combine all of those things into some score, I mean, that's, that's ultimately what I want to get to. It's got to be really sort of easy for other people to comprehend or just, you know, have that intuitive feel. Is it up or down? I've, what I found is like people really appreciate green arrow, red arrow, you know, with a little bit of commentary to explain what happened. That's what I'd like to get to. But I, I, yeah, because we're in so many channels, like I don't think I could put my finger on there's one, one metric. I think we have one more question, and then we'll... Hi, Mike Compton. You had mentioned that you were trying to get past just mere awareness because of the athletics program overshadowing probably every other facet of this institution. Um, at what point does the strategy, the messaging strategy, uh, the positioning strategy of the brand actually drive the construct of your metrics? other than, so how do, you, how do you link those two things so that somebody's working hard on trying to position the James Center or position OSU as a research institution, for instance? Is there a linkage that you, that you could talk about? Yes, and I think, I think where that link is, is getting into that idea of relevance, right? Is Ohio State being connected with that particular brand attribute that we're trying to drive, that one thing that we want to be known for? Um, once we can get to that, right, the, the, the thinking is that once we create this brand, right, there's application to any of the different units or lines of business, right, then you can start pushing that messaging out through your content marketing and through your direct response efforts, and then you'd start to get to that alignment and that unity. So, so Brian, let's, there really is only one metric that, that okay. you need, yes, you, you just need to beat Michigan, right? I know, right? Your... It's, it, it, we have looked at mentions of athletics and of sort of content marketing at Ohio State, and it's amazing how closely they're correlated, particularly at the end of November. <laughs> uh, well, we've only been tracking. They've been really good for all yeah. the time we've been tracking, so I can't, <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah, it's really key. How many, how many OSU grads are here? So, okay, so it's nice. Oh, we'll, it's we'll, a good crowd. We'll stop grilling. You're gonna stick yeah. around for a little bit if people yeah. have, uh, and you'll be back next month and you're done. You've been coming for five years just to get a chance to speak. That's, and now, yeah, now that's yeah. It. This, is, this is payback. Like, I finally am like contributing instead of <laughs> just like being snarky on Twitter. <laughs> I was wondering if you'd scheduled stuff dinging me while you were speaking. That's just yeah, I you should know, have. You're in social, so. So that was great, awesome, thanks, thanks. Uh, again. <laughs>